All right, so uh, good afternoon. I'm Luke Antiga, I'm CTO at Lightning AI. Um, how many of you know about Lightning AI in general? Great, so um, awesome. A uh, bit, of, bit of about my background, I'm a bioengineer, uh, graduated a very long time ago. And then I got into research. I did research for about 10 years in medical image analysis. And that's how what brought me into deep learning in the early 2010, uh, 2010s. Then I would participated to the development of PyTorch the very early days uh, in 2017, 18. And then I joined Lightning. Uh, and uh, in the time between, uh, from 2009 to, uh, uh, to, to that time, and uh, in 2009 I went from research and I founded my own company that is still doing uh, applied AI uh, in Italy, so it's called Aerobics. So I've been seeing a lot of things in AI, a lot of things that don't work, and a lot of problems that you want to solve and you can't solve. And so I saw a lot of opportunities to uh, to understand what you should focus on and what you should maybe not focus on and spend time on. Because ultimately, especially today in the post-ChatGPT -GPT era, right, um, in the Gen AI era, uh, it's become crazy. Uh, who, how many of you are students, like PhD students? Great. So. If I were a student right now, <laughs> I would be in so much pressure, right? Because new things are coming up every day. So how, even as a company, how do you cope with that? Like, what's the best strategy? Should you pick a model or a, an approach that works today and like make a roadmap to implement that thing on my application in the next eight months and then we try to see if it works? Or you try to move as fast as possible as in a, in a way that is uh, smooth so you can iterate not not only you can incorporate new things that are coming out or new ideas or fixes to approaches um, but also you can iterate with your customers or your stakeholders because most of the time the value of ai is not really clear like you know yes potentially ai will do this and that for me but will will it bring a, an actual advantage to whoever i'm interacting with um, and that you discover by doing. You don't discover by planning, usually. So you need to put yourself in a, in a condition where you can move fast and try things out. And at some point, value will emerge from this process. And so at Lightning, we're very, very focused on it, m allowing people to iterate as quickly as possible, as fast as possible, as organizations or as researchers, individuals. Um, by taking away certain things that get in the way. And the first thing we did was releasing PyTorch Lightning. Now, these numbers are a bit outdated, but um, PyTorch Lightning is a framework, and how many of you know about PyTorch Lightning? Many, not, not a lot of you have uh, um, used it recently, or maybe a lot of you have. Uh, it's, it's a framework that doesn't wrap PyTorch. It's not a Keras for PyTorch. Um, it's not a wrapper. You still write your model in PyTorch, but you break up your training code into methods and functions. So you organize your code so that we understand what you want to do at the different life cycle moments of your training code so we can take care of like scaling it out, changing devices, uh, saving checkpoints, aggregating logs in distributed, and so on. And uh, it's great for beginners, but it's actually at it's actually very used in the industry. We, we have, right now, we have 120 million downloads total, which is a lot of downloads, because a lot of organizations are using it internally. Because it kind of standardizes your machine learning code uh, so that you know, more people from your organization will understand it. And you don't end up making the same mistake over and over because you kind of delegate a few things to us, and particularly scale. Like stable diffusion, one one of the models, and all the models after it uh, that were trained using PyTorch Lightning and so on, and a lot of companies are standardizing on it. We have about seven million dollars per month now. Um, so, and what does it do for iteration? Well, it allows me to focus on the science and leave the engineering to PyTorch Lightning, so that when I need to scale up my model to many more machines, I can do it 
just by changing a setting without doing it manually. Sometimes you need to do it manually, sometimes you really care about that stuff, or sometimes your research is about that stuff, and we have libraries in our open source stack that do that. That library is Lightning Fabric. Lightning Fabric is basically the, the basic building blocks that make the PyTorch Lightning Trainer, but they are available to you. So you can take your uh, raw PyTorch code, and using Fabric, you can still scale it up without changing its structure. So you can keep your like raw training loops and so on. It's fine. Um, by just changing like five or six lines of code, you will be able to benefit from some of the advantages that PyTorch Lightning brings you, like logging, uh, checkpointing, distributed, and so on, <coughs> accelerators, uh, but without committing too much to the structure of your code. And we have many others that I will touch upon, like for example, in the language model space, we have LeadGPT that was derived uh, from, so the story is uh, when uh, Meta released the first Llama, uh, they released it with a GPL license, the source code was GPL licensed. So we said, okay, we, uh, let's create one that doesn't have this constraint. Um, and so we took Nano GPT from Andre Carpathy uh, and then, uh, implemented from the paper implemented llama from there which is not like uh, rocket science uh, but at the same time it's nice because now we have um, we had a llama implementation that was just one file it was like 200 lines which is great because you can see through it like other libraries are much more layered and you have many extractions so you need to if you want to know how the transformer block is you need to do some digging and if you want to change it it will take you some time to change it because it's a huge library here the, um, right now with LeadGPT, we support over 20 LLMs, all, all the latest ones and so on, but the model.py file is, is still 400 lines. And that's, there's, that's all there is. There's no other external dependencies. And this allows you to also make your own trade-offs and you know, uh, give you opportunities to optimize stuff. And in fact, we know of several companies, even not in the language space, I know one in the audio space, they took LeadGPT as a start, starting point and they modified it and now they have a very successful business because they trained the model that way. And the pre-training code is, again, 400 lines and there's nothing more around it. Of course, it uses Fabric uh, to simplify certain things, but um, that's what we wrote it for. And then Torch Metrics, probably you've seen it because it's used in very, very many projects, even the ones that are, do not use uh, Lightning. Uh, and we have new libraries coming out. I suggest you check them out. One is lead data, is uh, for distributed data uh, processing. So you can say, okay, I want to compute the embedding on the, I don't know, uh, uh, Swedish Wikipedia, um, and I want to do it across machines. And then you can do it with, with lead data, will you know, uh, chunk things properly, you can map computation across collections. Uh, but also, it will optimize your data for streaming into training code. So if you have a, like a two terabytes data set, but you don't have two terabytes disks attached to your machine, uh, you can use lead data to stream just what you need in a binary form, optimized binary format. So things become easier. And again, you see a pattern here, like leave the complications and focus on actually loading the data and, and uh, uh, and training your model. And the, the, uh, the, the other one is that we haven't, so these ones are new, we haven't really launched them officially, so it's kind of a preview. It's LitServe, it's kind of like PyTorch Lightning for serving. Uh, it makes it really easy, it's, it's a small library, but makes it really easy to serve models, both in streaming, uh, with automatic batching, uh, it, you can expose open AI compatible APIs really super easily. Uh, so if you want to serve a model, for your internal needs, and you don't want a bulky serving framework that it's kind of a black boxy, that you need to export your model and you don't know what happens, then uh, Litzer. It's evolving really quickly, so uh, you'll see more about this. And then last, it's Lightning Thunder, which is our compiler. Uh, we presented at GTC. Uh, we're developing together uh, with NVIDIA, and I'll be happy to talk to you about it um, if you come to the booth, but it's not in scope for this. Uh, it just Thunder fundamentally introduces the concept of first-class program transformation. So you have a model, and nowadays, whatever you want to do to that model, like make it distributed or do, it, do other things like quantization and so on, or LoRa, um, 
uh, tensor parallelism, all these things, you need to change the code of the model, uh, which is great, except that in our day, nowadays you have complex architectures and you want to find the sweet spot between, oh, what kernels should I use? What distributed strategy should I use? And so on. Uh, and Thunder allows you to programmatically transform your code so that it has all these combinations of things so that you can optimize and run faster ultimately uh, or more efficiently. And this was our open source stack. Our uh, infra, that is, where do you run that code? Because it's all well and good. Libraries are great. But now, how do I run it? Like, uh, how do I get access to GPUs? Uh, and so we, and how do I manage my environments? One of the most painful things for researchers, people, you know, practitioners, is I have an environment that works. Now I want to change the machine, or I want to run the thing on multiple machines, and it worked on one. I need to replicate the environment, and the environment is many things. It's also, you know, it's a source code, it's the packages, it's the data, the way I lay it out. And typically people spend, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 percent of their time dealing with this stuff. And if they are on the cloud, how do you set up a uh, machines for you know fast interconnect you know so that I can run multi-node uh, efficiently and so on um, and so this is what studio solves at the core it gives you an AI development environment and we'll take a look at it uh, right now so let's take a look at studio and the way you need to think about it is that with lightning you get a whole stack of things and it's not exclusive like in studio you can run Jax or tensorflow it doesn't matter of course, if you use our stack, then everything is very uh, frictionless. Again, iteration king, uh, speed is king, right? It's very frictionless. If I run on a single studio and want to scale out to multiple machines, and I'm using PyTorch Lightning to run my training code, I don't need to do anything. It will just work. If I use Jax or other things, then I need to you know, take care of that a bit more in the code, which is completely fine. We don't want to, like, to us, you can use either of these or none of these or a piece of that. If you use them together, it all flows. If you don't use them together, you, you know, you live your adventure. And, you know, we, uh, we actually have a lot of templates that show how to do stuff with things that are not in our stock. Just, you know, uh, it's an important point to um, underline. So, Let's take a peek at what Lightning is. So Lightning, one sec, I need to control shift with a microphone is not really great. OK. So this is our website. You can go here. You can sign up, start free. You get a free studio plus credits. So you can run uh, for free. And I'll let you look into it. I'm not going to touch upon this again. Um, and let's see what we can do here. So here we landed on something that is my home. And what I want to do is to show you, for example, how we can run an LLM and run multi-node and then go and experiment with fault tolerance. So we'll see a node having a problem and we'll see the multi-node run restarting itself. It's just a, a demonstration, uh, the amount of things that happen behind the scenes that you don't need to uh, take care of. Um, but first of all, I want to introduce you to Studio. What is Studio? A Studio is just your laptop, but running on the cloud, essentially. Uh, if you're allergic to coding in a browser, which I can assure you is a great experience, it's very sticky, you know. When I started using the product, and it wasn't out, of course, uh, around July last year, my lazy brain said, yeah, keep doing that instead of SSH into your servers and stuff like that. So I, I just, just give it a shot. But if you don't want to code on, on in a browser, you can still uh, connect from a local VS Code. It's an immediate thing. You just press a button, VS Code opens, and you open your files. Uh, so uh, it's not a constraint. It's a feature, let's say. OK, here I have a whole machine. It's running on CPU. Um, let's take, for example, uh, an example from the PyTorch Lightning README. This autoencoder, not very complicated model, uh, on MNIST, very, very small. Uh, did I paste it twice? Yes. Great. 
and this is an autoencoder, you know, the autoencoder. It takes an input, shrinks it down, then expands it again, and then compares input and output and see what the deviation is. Then tries to decompress it most efficiently by creating good intermediate representations throughout the model until the bottleneck. Right, so this is training. Of course, it's on CPU. This is like or <laughs> already kind of fast because the model is super tiny, but it's just for demonstration purposes. Now, I want to run it on a GPU, but let's run it on four GPUs. I can just request a machine. I can still keep doing my thing. I can also invite more people here. Like if I start a live session, I can have another person coding with me. Um, and now the machines are ready. Sorry, the machine is one with four GPUs. Um, and it's already, I'm already in the other environment. So everything has like from, if I install dependencies there, it would have been perfectly preserved. So I can do it like it's a duplication I do for myself on another machine type and I can just keep going now, right? But since I'm using PyTorch lining here to run the, the model, then it will auto detect GPU is available initialize the distributed run, and now it runs on four GPUs. Uh, in a few seconds, you will see metrics streaming up there. Um, it takes a few seconds after startup for the, these metrics to be available, which is great. So we learned that we have a reproducible environment, and this is running. I'll keep it running. And um, I can duplicate it. So if I do a duplication of this environment, I get the exact same environment but a copy of it so I can keep working. And so if you imagine being in this, we call it team space with other users, right? Your team, you can assign a budget to this, you can invite members, and then you can say, okay guys, can you start from this one doing this project because I set it up and then you duplicate it, you go. Uh, but also you can also publish it more generally. Uh, we have studio templates here for an organization or in the public gallery where the community is publishing their studios right now. Just take a look, I, I, I don't want to spend too much time here. But here you can find things like, uh, I don't know, uh, deploy audio generation API, function calling, DSPy, PyTorch Lining, hello world. Things are probably listening with PyTorch Lining. It's landing, it's really interesting because now you can use D-tensors We're using PyTorch Lining. You can do model parallelism, like 2D parallelism uh, mixing FSTP and tensor parallelism. Um, and then, yeah, uh, RAG applications. You can deploy APIs and expose APIs to the outside world, or you can build compound AI systems where one studio runs and serves a LLM, and then the other studio will run a RAG workflow and will use that first studio API to do their thing. So it becomes really easy not only to train, uh, but also to uh, develop systems that you can then expose to customers. Um, and how you do that is quite easy. Like for example, if I'm, uh, this is a mixed trial mixture of expert studio. It already contains the checkpoints. So if I can just open in the studio, it will run on, I think one uh, 8NG instance, and it's just duplicating, we'll leave it there. Uh, are there questions up until now? All good? Um, yep, question. Uh, so I was wondering about your, um, the serif, the, the, I think it's the serif. Yep. How does it uh, feel as compared to kind of all the things, all the options like closer to VLM? For, oh yeah, so VLLM has things that LitServ doesn't have right now. So from a purely uh, serving perspective, like web server and orchestration perspective, lit server is very fast. What it doesn't have yet is the management of the KV cache the way uh, VLLM does. And so we're, you know, progressing towards uh, having some of these optimizations in, in the next few weeks or months. Um, but if you need to serve something that doesn't stream or doesn't have a KV cache, uh, well, sorry, doesn't stream. Streaming is, is there. Um, the point is, so it's very fast, but it, it will be good for low batch sizes. So if you want to deploy a private API um, for Llama 3 for just one or two users at a time, 
then it will be as fast as BLLM is. It depends then on how your model is. If you have 60 people, then you need to start doing dynamic, like continuous batching and the page attention stuff that BLLM does or variations of that, and we don't have that yet. So if you are in the throughput, uh, uh, throughput bound regime and you have H100s you want to fully utilize, then you need to do things manually in Litzer and VLLM gives you for free. In all the other cases, it's, it's really great. You can serve from multiple GPUs, it, it, you will handle you know, a queue over requests and so on, will keep the queue bounded, it, it does all the things you need to, to do in that case. Um, all right, so yeah, I have a mixed trial, mixture of experts here, and it already started something probably, so I can just check if it started, it's running on a 1.8 ng, and uh, this is like first time it's running. It's actually using, uh, I think, Olama in this case, just to say you don't need to use our stock. You know, this uses Olama, and Olama quantizes things so that they run. Even large models run on a 1.8 ng. Um, we're working on similar optimizations right now, like the way Olama does it. It, through uh, Lama CPP, is it, they quantize the weights, so the memory bandwidth is not saturated, and the GPU can just compute. Um, so this is loading. So Ola, this is Olama loading their stuff, and it will start streaming really quick, really soon, hopefully. Let's see the logs. Seems to be all good. And at the same time, I think we can also start. So it's really easy to develop applications that you can then expose. Like for example, I have a 50 line stream late application that will serve a chat, and then I can expose it through a port to the outside world. And I can protect that through password or token authentication. Um, and then I can just chat with it. Now, uh, bef before we chat with it, oh, here, it's done. So, yeah, I have a public link. I, if I open the public link, I have my Streamlit thing, and I can say, hello. Um, how is Paris? And so this is serving mixed trial mixture of experts to the outside world, right? Um, and then you can have an API, you can expose stuff like that. So it's really easy to build compound system. It took me two minutes. You just need a server, and then you, you, you can expose it outside. Um, when you expose it outside, you can also choose to auto-wake it up. So you can say, okay, I want this to um, auto-start. And so when, when I auto start it, I can let the studio sleep, and then whenever I go to that URL, it will spin up, cold start, and we'll just start serving. Um, so it's great for private APIs and so on. All right, so let's go back to the studios that we were running, and then I'll just show you uh, how to run a multi-node run. So we were here, and we were training our autoencoder. Not very exciting. But now we want to, and here it's happily continuing, now we want to go multi-node. What does multi-node mean? Well, you know, we introduced this concept of um, reproducible environments here. That means that if you want to train on 16 nodes, we can do the same thing, right? We can clone our environment and just run it through. Um, and this is the, what we'll do exactly right now. So we can add a training run here point it to our main.py file, which is here, and I say, okay, now train it on eight T4s, eight four T4s, so 32 GPUs. Uh, we have the concept of fault tolerance, and I'll show you a bit about that right now, and we can keep machines running, so if the thing goes down, I can just restart the software layer, and the machines will keep running, so I don't need to reprovision them. We support uh, reservations. So uh, if you reserve machines, you can map them to your team space. Um, so this is running. 
Um, these are, uh, yesterday we did a run with 1,250 machines. So the orchestration layer is really, really solid. So I'm just showing you a few machines uh, just for the for the demo. And then the last thing I want to show you is the automatic recovery. So this is gonna run. At the same time, I'm gonna start this studio that contains a pre-training run for LLMs. So um, uh, as I mentioned, we have this code base called LeadGPT, which is our code base for uh, pre-training uh, deploying, uh, fine-tuning uh, more than 20 LLMs, and as I told you, the, the model .py is super short. If you go into here, uh, you can find the whole definition of any of these 20 here. It's you know, super simple to go through. It's actually a good resource to actually understand how these things work, because you, know, you go through it and, well, uh, it's all in there. There are no mysteries. And it's pretty amazing that these things do what they do with, with this like uh, simplicity at the core. Um, and so what I did is uh, I created a studio that contains this code. And um, LigiPT is nice because also it has a very easy to use uh, CLI uh, thing where you can download a, a model from the Hugging Face hub and in the future others. Uh, you can check with it. You can launch a pre-training based on that architecture. You can fine-tune using QLoRa or LoRa and so on. And then you can serve using streaming as well. And of course, it uses LitServe under the hood. Uh, so you can cover the whole life cycle for LLMs. And we have many studios that you can look at, the templates uh, that go from pre-training to through all these steps. Um, but essentially, if you want to do a multi-machine run here, let's wait until this is active, yes. Okay, I already have the multi-node. I can just run it. I can just uh, copy the command line that I'm supposed to run on each node. And again, with fault tolerance, and we can start. So what we are doing now is we are launching LigiPT pre-train. It's a PTF, uh, if you look at the definition, it's a PTF 14 million model, so it's very small. But it already trains on the red pyjama plus star coders uh, data sets, which is one trillion tokens. And we are accessing that through lead data streaming from the cloud. So you see how these different pieces fit together to provide you velocity, right? So now I, if I want to add some data here or change the data, I can just use lead data to augment the data sets. Um, of course, you know, quality of data is everything, but that's where you should spend your time, right? Uh, not in making infrastructure work, because that's a problem that can be solved uh, using approaches that uh, are well documented. Um, okay, so let's wait until this is running. And in the meantime, let's look at the other run. So the other run, very small model. I can get into a single machine here. And if I want to SSH into one single node to understand what's going on, why that node is not running as fast as I would expect, I can just run whatever command. I have machine as my disposal. This is one node in the cluster, right? I can just go into it, install packages, run profiling, do whatever I need to do. Um, I don't know if I have time uh, left. Probably not that much, one minute. So um, any questions so far? Yes. Glad you asked. <laughs> so, um, yeah, each team space can be, which is a collection of users and blah, 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 budgets, uh, can also be connected to cloud accounts, multiple of them. So we have our managed cloud account, but you can connect it to AWS. Now we're rolling out GCP. 
And so these are all private accounts. And when that happens, all the studios, all the jobs, all the data for the studios or the data you attached uh, are all on your v VPC. So we only orchestrate it. The only time when data will go out of that in transit is when you visualize it on the, on the, on the browser. But we'll just proxy that. We never store anything. So uh, you can also choose whatever region you want. So if you're in Europe, you can keep everything in Europe, right? Um, uh, and, uh, and then we will be run, um, releasing Slurm as well uh, in the future. So, yep, this is um, cloud, adding cloud accounts. And uh, let's see if this guy started. Otherwise, any other questions? Well, this is AWS not giving us machines in this moment. It's not an orchestration problem. They will come up eventually. Yeah, they're coming up. So if I go in and kill processes here, the whole thing will recover itself. So if you leave me just one minute, I will uh, try to demo that. Uh, but we, we need to wait until this, this thing starts actually running on GPUs. So these are all the GPUs we're running on. And this is LeadGPT uh, validating itself and running. I'm not sure we'll be on time showing that, though. Well, we'll leave it running. One more question? Yep. We, well, we have our own orchestration, and then we use Torch Distributed and PyTorch Lightning to orchestrate the training, yeah. Um, but you can use whatever, like, if, you know, uh, provided that the provisioning is something we take care of, everything on top, it can, can be customized, yeah. We have the concept of plugins that we let our enterprise customers develop, and so they can get more in depth into the orchestration. Here, yeah, GPU is starting. And the nice thing is that we also, um, yeah, see metrics in real time. So things are kind of starting here and there, and then they will start like in earnest to, uh, to train this LLM. VRAM is still low because the LLM is a 14 million model, and we have a lot of RAM on these machines, so. Uh, all, everything you see here is the tests that we're doing ahead of time because we're testing how many uh, teraflops you have there, if everything looks good, um, if nickel was initialized property, properly. And we set up the cluster in such a way that if the instances allow it, we use fast interconnect between the instances. So you have fast networking automatically. You don't need to think about it. All right, so yeah, thanks a lot. I think my time is up. I hope, you know, if you have further questions, we're at the booth, and uh, I hope you try it out. Like, if you sign up, it's free. You get credits every month, so you can just play with it, not talk to us, and then just you know, go away or, you know, uh, join our Discord. Thank you. <laughs>